Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. Everyone seems to focus on investing in the next cool ag tech company or food startup. But what if the real scalable impact can be made in investing in already existing more mature food companies which have built trust with consumers through their brand and already are running programs around regenerative or sustainable practices for their farmers? What if you can invest in these companies and enable them to go further and deeper? And of course, what kind of investment structure do you need to do this? Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our membership community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check gumroad.com slash investingregionag or find the link below. Thank you. Welcome to another episode. Today with Stephen, the founder of Grounded Capital Partners, which was created to align resources for a regenerative food system and with a different approach to capital, committed to investing in the health of a system rather than monetizing the symptoms of an unhealthy system. So much to unpack there. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you for having me. You've been in, quote unquote, this space for quite a while. What led you, I mean, this is a very long answer potentially, but I'm very eager to unpack your journey. What led you to found Grounded Capital Partners? What was your journey, your journey into soil, first of all, but then also obviously what we'll unpack Grounded Capital Partners further, but what got you to soil to begin with? My undergraduate degree was in agriculture and agribusiness, but I went to work on Wall Street after college and spent the first half of my career investing across a broad range of assets. Why did you choose ag? Why did you choose ag as an undergrad study? You know, I have just always had a connection to the land, whether it's the wilderness or I grew up around cattle ranches, although we didn't raise cattle, but not on a ranch itself. I had a father who grew up on a walnut orchard, and it was something that I was curious about. And even when I studied it, didn't think that I would go into agriculture straight out of school, but always wondered if I could somehow later on combine my interest in ag with access to capital, my experience in the capital markets and my values. And that's what led me to this journey. And so what made you choose to choose Wall Street? So you were done with your ag studies. You could have joined maybe some big ag companies or, or some, some large corporates, but you went to Wall Street. Was it a very deliberate or more an accidental choice? It was deliberate. I had a lot of interest in investing, and this was in the mid-90s when there were a lot of interesting things going on in Silicon Valley. And there was a firm called Montgomery Securities that was involved with a lot of that. And it was sort of the early days of technology investing and that ecosystem on the West Coast. And that was very attractive to me. And then... What made you, I wouldn't say decide to leave Wall Street, I mean, you're still deep in finance, but what were the steps after that sort of bringing you back to ag or bringing you back to food? Well, I had been part of a firm that we sold in 2007 and it provided, when we sold it, I had an opportunity to think about what I was going to do next, stay there and continue building what I had started or pursue this. And uh, in October of 2007, I decided to take off and go figure it out and uh, really just had one North Star, and that was to figure out how to spend my time investing capital, private capital along the value chain of our food system in ways that would promote more regenerative land management practices, the production of healthy food at scale, and connect people to each around a thesis that I had been thinking about for how I believed our food system was evolving. So... But 2007, that was quite early in this movement. What, do you remember 
Did you even use the words regenerative? If so, where did you see them? What was the first, because I don't think it was part of your undergrad, I'm guessing here. What triggered you to look beyond sustainability or deep into this topic? Were you reading at night when you were working Wall Street? What was the, the trigger to go very deep in this when not very many people were looking at it? Well, for one, I didn't know where I was headed with it. I knew what I was interested in exploring. And I spent a couple of years exploring that. I joined the investment committee of a family office in Marin County that whose foundation was doing a study of the food system. I worked with companies that we would now call ag tech, but that were measuring soil organic matter and water and structure. And so it wasn't until about 2010, 11, when I actually started pursuing investments in the space. And um, really, I was focused on taking more of a systems-based approach. I was very interested in what I had, had observed in other things that I enjoyed doing in, in the wilderness and the relationship between people and ecosystems. And in agriculture, had spent some time thinking about the fact that before the industrialization of our food system, we used to farm in ways that were focused on maintaining the health of the system. We would rotate crops, we would integrate livestock, and we maybe had to do that because that's how we built fertility, broke weed cycles, and broke pest cycles. But it was interesting to me, especially going through a very conventional, industrially focused agribusiness program that provided, a, I was wonderfully beneficial, but had a different view than, than I subscribed to. Why after the food system started and ag started to industrialize, we shifted to this mindset of trying to control systems rather than live with them and to really treat the symptoms of unhealthy systems through external inputs. And I started to think about how we not only were doing that in agriculture, but also doing it in human health and in other ways. And I was very interested in the role of capital and how capital could actually be used to connect the dots in building a healthier food system starting with soil all the way to the consumer. And you mentioned you started investing in the space or working on the investing side, let's say 10 years ago. How was the landscape back then? Like bring us back to 2011, 2010. I remember because I, I was starting to follow the space very from a distance then, but I don't think the word soil popped up so often. What did you see like more working on the investing side? What was the regenerative ag used as a word? Were the principles sort of known or was it still very, very early? Well, there were a lot of people doing this work long before I was and, and some you know others of us. I had the benefit of learning from a lot of people early on. And, um, you know, people may not have used the word regenerative. And I often think back to the saying that my grandmother ate organically. She just didn't have a word for it. And so I really benefited from the people whom I met in the first few years who were farming in ways that were focused on the system. And, I, you know, different people define regenerative in different ways, but I often think of it as building the health of that system through the whatever activities we're engaging in. And different things are possible in different places at different times with different people. And so I was really interested in understanding how different farmers or agronomists or stakeholders that might have been tangential to the actual farming or approaching these things. And so what has changed in that 10 years? Where are we finding ourselves now? It's almost the end of 2021. It's a very broad question. What, what do you see? What's most exciting? What is most interesting? Or most surpri Let's say what's most surprising in those 10 years for you? One of the things I've observed is that there's a tendency to invest capital in products. And so often what I see, as I think you mentioned earlier, a lot of those solutions essentially monetize the symptoms of an unhealthy system rather than build the health of that system. And very often, the ongoing value proposition of those enterprises is dependent on the system staying unhealthy. And so one of the, the biggest learnings for me was in engaging people and connecting the dots of solutions that already exist rather than inventing something new. And 
what what example i mean there must be many over the last decade but what's the the clearest example what comes to mind when you talk about that what has been the the clearest way to explain that with a concrete example well i think this is evolving but early on there was a tendency to look to ag tech and food tech as a solution rather than a tool and i think that a lot of the technological products are really important tools in order to support a more regenerative food system but they in and of themselves are not the solution and they attract a lot of capital and attention they attract yeah. a lot of capital if you look at what ag tech has been raising yeah astonishing and it's the same thing with food products we see a lot of people trying to invent new food products that on the surface look great but if you were actually to evaluate how the ingredients are grown or how they're produced they aren't necessarily better for people or the planet and so it'll be interesting to see how that evolves the hype around yeah a lot of the animal protein alternatives etc i mean unless unless you take the ingredient sourcing into account yeah we can ask a lot of questions about the life cycle assessment or the impact that that can have or how much better it is we did an interview i will link it below as well with a vegan cheese company in amsterdam and they did a life cycle assessment and found out that the ingredients they used mostly cashew nuts had a horrible carbon footprint because they were shipped to they came from i think it was west africa shipped somewhere else came back for processing with a lot of natural gas or basically just gas and the carbon footprint was quite interesting let's say they weren't as sustainable as they hoped they would be and now they're switching their whole ingredient stack to beans and to other ingredients that you can actually grow in the netherlands but it was quite a shock and they're one of the few unfortunately alternative protein companies i think in europe that is looking at their ingredients and not just claim we don't sell cheese made out of milk so we are better like there's a lot more nuance there and and there, we're going to be in for some I wouldn't say nasty but unfortunate surprises there that the the, the overall impact is not going to be as as nice as the commercial makes us believe. I've observed something similar, and uh, I do believe that we shall eat more plants. Absolutely. But uh, a lot of the products that are out there, maybe even with the best of intentions, you know, perception isn't necessarily reality. Yeah. And so you learned an incredible amount, and then you decided to found, sorry, co-found Grounded Capital Partners. First of all, the name where, I mean, it comes, we can have multiple explanations of that, but what gave the name to it? What made you decide to choose a name, which is a very significant thing for a company, especially a long-term capital company that's hopefully going to be around for a long time. This name is going to be there as well. Like how difficult was that process and why did you come to this name? I think every rock, mountain, tree, river, or lake had already been chosen. But uh, <laughs> aside from that, we spent a lot of time thinking about the name and just like probably anybody wanted it to reflect our values. And as we started to think about those three words, we felt like they were reflective. And so we actually have spent quite a bit of time thinking about what grounded means to us and how does it relate to what we're doing? What does capital mean to us, which is for us much more than financial assets? It's people, it's well, on our website, we kind of define this, so I won't take the time. And then partners represented all of the stakeholders we're engaging with in the food system. And so we felt it was reflective of who we are and what we're doing. And why did you start it? Moving from connecting the dots, let's say, on the supply side, working with a lot of farmers, working to, to transition or to help them start a transition or continue their transition, you decided to build up something else, still focus on Regen Ag, but on a different part of the supply chain or supply web. Why was that? Or why is that? Sure. So in the beginning, I was very focused on land and production and looking at the opportunity to decouple the output of regenerative agricultural operations from the commodity markets through branding or adding value or some degree of vertical integration as a way to capture more retail margin at a farm level and help farmers get paid for these better practices. And I spent, you know, the first half of the last decade exploring different categories of food. Initially, I, with partners on behalf of investors, first acquired something called the Hana Ranch in uh, Maui, Hawaii, two water utilities and an interest in a meat packing and distribution called, called Maui Cattle Company. And the goal there was to build a model for vertically integrated regenerative ag in a state that imports 85% of the food that's consumed and 90% of the energy. 
And what was so interesting there was the interdependence, the fact that you couldn't solve for the food supply if you didn't solve for water, and you couldn't solve for water if you didn't solve for energy. And in many ways, we all thought that Hawaii was really a microcosm of the rest of the world and an interesting place to explore this. I then spent time focused on a vertically integrated beef company and then on diversified fruits and vegetables and then on nuts. And my interest was in understanding each of these categories of food relative to one another within the food system, but also from soil to the consumer. And about three or four years ago, observed that we were so focused on building supply, but oftentimes we were struggling to build, to create demand for the output. Meaning you were working with all these great farmers and ranchers and practices, and then there wasn't really a, a ready buyer to appreciate what they did, or you, had, you were forced to sell into the commodity markets or just was a misfit? Like what was the issue? Like you had this and there was nobody interested in it or the people were interested were too far away or literally or culturally or the price was too different. What was the, the issue with the supply? Weren't we ready for it? Yeah. Well, as you might imagine, there were several factors. So one, it was connecting with buyers, but two was also middle infrastructure. So we were fortunate to be well capitalized and be able to acquire or build these things on our own. And also to collaborate with others who were doing similar work. But one of the things that we observed was that many farmers and ranchers who wanted to produce food in these ways didn't have access to those resources. So processing, marketing, platforms, sales channels, everything basically that happens beyond the farm gate. That's right. And a lot of my thinking around that started with something I had observed in the wine industry. And so I, I've been exploring a thesis that I believe our food system is increasingly being redefined by fragmentation and that we are shifting back to more human scale brands that are authentic, traceable, transparent, and connect directly with the consumer through a number of different ways. But I also thought the wine industry was so interesting as a proxy for what, for these changes because I was curious about why and how we had gone from 300 to 10,000 brand wine brands in the U.S. And along the way, we crossed a tipping point where we went from the small guys trying to look like the big guys to the big guys trying to look like the small guys. And at a point, the big guys had to start buying the small guys to stay relevant with an evolving consumer for a whole bunch of reasons. The same in beer, I think. Like wine was first, but I think yes. in, in the artisanal beer, boom. I think it was after that, but it's interesting that alcohol is leading the way here. But so, okay, we pushed it, we went through the tipping point, and then what happened? Like, what's the wine industry looks like now? So if you think about what, you know, you mentioned beer, it was easier for this to happen in higher margin categories first. Think about chocolate and coffee and so on. And now we're seeing this happen all the way down to fresh produce and proteins. But in the wine industry, I would suggest that initially it was very difficult for that change to occur. You had people who were growing grapes in ways that were better for the land, for better flavor profiles, in ways that got them paid a premium in the commodity market, but really didn't allow them to fully realize the value of the work they were doing. And along the way, without getting into a longer story about the evolution of this, there were people who came along and realized it made sense to invest in capital equipment to produce wine, to build a winery to make wine for 25 brands, let's say, rather than each brand winery having to build their own facility. And with that capital equipment and the investment in that capital equipment, built was an ecosystem that was created around services. And it touches on a lot of what you just mentioned a minute ago. Winemaking expertise, branding, cold storage, regional distribution. And so that grape grower all of a sudden had a turnkey solution to connect with the consumer and to vertically integrate to whatever degree they wanted. And it didn't mean they had to produce their own wine brand, but they could, if they chose to, crush their grapes and have somebody make bulk wine, which they sold, which got them a little bit more of the margin. Or they could partner with a wine brand that would purchase their grapes. And so I happen to believe, I don't happen to believe, I've observed that the consumer likes this. I mean, that's maybe what, one of the biggest shifts. The consumer is clearly voting with their dollars or euros or yens or 
to prefer different wines, different beers, different chocolates, different coffees, and thus potentially also all the other things you just mentioned of, of vegetables and proteins, etc., which is very encouraging. They are. And if you look at the spins data, these companies, these authentic companies that consumers are connecting with are taking share from the big guys. And if we were to discuss the consumer more, it appears that the consumer increasingly values attributes in their food that look more like those attributes they valued before the industrialization of our food system than after. So it's not necessarily about local or organic, although that can help and make some of the other things that I think they're trying to achieve easier. But it, food is increasingly experiential. And I believe that consumers are looking for simple foods that, that relate to who they believe they are, who their values are. And it was interesting. If you think about the industrialization of our food system, you know, you had a consumer who had a very close connection with the source of their food beforehand, right? Either a relationship with the farmer or the rancher, the company adding value to their food, or to their grocer whom they relied on to vet their food choices for them. And with the industrialization of the food system and these wonderful but more shallow attributes of price, packaging, convenience, and in many ways being marketed to through television in ways that they had never seen before, the consumer handed over the ownership of their relationship with food and gave it to these companies who were ubiquitous and told people what they should buy based on who they wanted to be. And it was really a race to the bottom from a production perspective because all of a sudden farmers were selling into a blind pool and there was no longer any connection between the consumer and the source of their food. And that worked for a while because the consumer was so enamored with all of these new attributes. But I believe that led by a generation of people who can't figure out why we thought TV dinners were so exciting in the 70s and 80s and a society that takes the positive attributes of industrialized food for granted that we're reconnecting with the source of our food and actually looking for something that is less manufactured and is more authentic. And what is the role of Grounded in that? Like, What is your role? How do you see your role to in this transition? So in starting to focus on the demand end of the supply chain, I was really interested in the opportunity about four years ago to work with food companies that were already mission-driven and had a desire to have transparent, high-integrity supply chains and help them look back up the supply chain and consider co-packing and manufacturing and their relationship with farmers to then bring resources to those farmers and direct, develop direct offtake relationships with them in order to drive more demand for regeneratively produced ingredients. And as I've done that work with several different companies and I realized that there's so many ways to participate in all of this. And, there, and I realized that the way that I felt I could have the most impact and also where I could invest capital at some scale for investors to really be catalytic in supporting change was to create a platform where we would make maybe one to two investments in established, mission-driven, profitable food companies that maybe are facing a generational transition in leadership or ownership, don't want to sell to traditional private equity or a strategic, but where we can partner with the management team of that company and support their efforts to build a platform in that category of food that not only is beneficial to other smaller companies that are aligned in mission, but also where there was an opportunity to look all the way back to the soil and with some scale support programs that those companies, many of which have already established programs that are, that are working, but only represent a fraction of their ingredients to support farmers on the ground to create demand for the output of those operations, to create transparency from soil all the way through to their consumers, and to replicate this across different categories of food. And over a really long time, build a portfolio of holdings that represent very mission-driven companies that hopefully support a more regenerative food system and can be catalytic in supporting change. And you very deliberately target 
or choose to work with, um, and, and you're going to work in the future because we're talking, you haven't done the first deal yet, but we'll hopefully we'll check in when that happens, but very deliberately or working with food companies that have a certain scale, not the, the small startups that start in a, and not, not something that has to start from scratch, but very deliberately partnering with somebody that has a certain scale, a certain size that can, of course, is not perfect yet in all the ingredient sourcing, etc. But that's where probably the opportunity lies. And is it correct if I'm saying that you've seen that that's these companies are lacking investors, are lacking long-term capital investors to take them further? Is that what you, because they don't want to sell to a private equity or to any strategic or to any big food company? They want to stay relatively independent, but they don't have many options then where to raise capital and take a few more steps. Yeah, I think that the companies that we have worked with and are talking with are looking for an aligned partner who has been thinking about these things for quite some time, is interested in a bigger picture, and believes that they can be catalytic. And I initially was focused on smaller startup companies, and I, I believe that work is really important. But where I've ended up is in a place where if our goal is to build the next generation of leading food companies, that starting with some scale is very beneficial. Not only do you have a platform on which to grow, but you also have programs that are working. And sometimes there's a tendency, I think, in impact investing to want to invent the solution. And be perfect. Yes. And that's a whole different discussion. But there is an opportunity to use the work that other people have done or to build on the work that other people have done to really have significant impact. A couple of weeks ago, I was having a conversation with someone and he was mentioning that there's such a, there has, is a tendency to focus on growth rates and in pitch books. And we were talking about the fact that if our goal is really to have impact, we want to be measuring in numbers of farmers, number of people, and acres. And so while the growth rates of going from 100 acres to 1,000 or 10,000 acres might be really impressive, and it is, going from 100,000 acres to 500,000 acres in the same period of time might be just as impactful, but maybe not as sexy. And so our interest is in partnering with these management teams and these organizations to see if we can step this up to a more, to a greater scale. And how do you structure it? Because what often comes back on the podcast is liquidity, but we'll get to that in a second, but also the time horizon of uh, horizons actually of many of the funds that are active that, that claim to be impact investors. And then when you drill down a bit, you say, okay, what's the investment horizon and when do you need to exit? It's usually 10 years plus maybe one or two. And I can probably already see the reaction of the companies you're talking to that have spent 20 years or 10 years building this. I don't think they're too enthusiastic to get somebody on board that has all the values, but at some point has to forcefully, in many cases, actually exit. You mentioned holding, like what is the solution there? Because I know you think about this slightly different than the rest of, let's say, quote unquote, the industry. How do you partner with these companies on the really long term? So I think that there's a role for different profiles of capital. And when any organization chooses to take venture capital or family office or some other profile of capital, it's not necessarily right or wrong, but they're choosing a path. For the work that we're doing and the timeframes, we feel that having an indefinite mindset around time is really important and that investing with a mindset of holding a, that investment or investing in that company indefinitely changes how you make decisions versus deploying the capital, needing to grow the capital, and then return the capital to investors within a 10-year fund structure. Speculative mindset, yeah. <laughs> versus, I wouldn't say maybe abundance or emerging, but yeah, it's a different operating method if you know you have to get out in 10 years or eight years, depending on when you invest in the, in the life cycle of a fund. Yeah. And, and I think it's appropriate at times and maybe less strategic at, at other times. So what's interesting though, is oftentimes investors want liquidity. And so we've, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking with others over the years about balancing that. 
and how do you build a permanent portfolio but create mechanisms for liquidity for investors so that they have the option to exit if they choose to at whatever interval is appropriate for that enterprise. And so how how are you in the future going to organize that or how are you organizing this currently? Because that's probably investors will say immediately, oh, that sounds extremely interesting building a portfolio, an indefinite portfolio of extremely interesting companies that are all on a journey and are scaling from 100,000 hectares to 500, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's this little scary uh, voice in their head. Yeah, what if I want to get out? How do you do that in a practical way that makes sense for both the company, of course, you as a structure and also for the investor? People are addressing it different ways. In some cases, they are creating markets between their existing investors so that they can buy each other out. You get out and I get in. Yeah. So you sell to somebody who's already in it. Yeah. That's right. We've explored structures that allow us to provide Windows liquidity for investors at specific intervals. And I don't think I'm able to get into the details of Grounded too deeply since we are raising capital. I don't know how I have to be careful what I say here. Yeah, of course. But at least there's, you figured out different ways to provide that sense of liquidity and real liquidity if needed. Yes. And there are, as you think about even a permanent portfolio, there are periods where liquidity is generated. And so there are a lot of mechanisms that you can solve for this, but it's a shift. And taking a longer term approach to investing capital is something that requires a lot of explanation at times. So how has been the response from investors when you even drop that word of a, a permanent portfolio? What's Are they leaning back? Are they leaning forward? What is the surprise on their face? Or are they mostly, I wouldn't say not mostly, but are there enough, like say, ready phases like, oh, we've been waiting for something like this? Well, it's so interesting. So I'm not speaking about grounded right now, but in conversations that I've had with investors and with others, we often hear that from investors that they would like a more permanent vehicle that looks like a holding company. But when you press on most investors, they want that, but they also want it to look like what they know, which is a 10-year fund. Which is a tension that is difficult to fix for. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fine, right? We're at yeah. this inflection point where this work is maturing. But it's not completely out there anymore. It's not completely crazy. Like there's enough, at least it's not a thousand no's in a thousand meetings because that would be quite discouraging, I can imagine. Well, think about this as a period of adolescence for investing in regenerative agriculture. You know, early on, there was a saying that if you want a job in regenerative agriculture, you have to create it. And now we see a lot of new investors coming into the space, which has its own challenges. But in many ways, it's growing up. And there's an awkwardness right now in that transition from the very early days to a more mature investment. And you know, it's so interesting, but there are a lot of investable opportunities out there, but you aren't necessarily seeing them at the conferences or in the media. And one of the things I've observed is there may be an inverse correlation between how impactful the work is that an organization is doing and how often you see them at a conference or in the news. Because they're very busy, the ones that are interesting. Yeah. <laughs> they're depending on the marketing to drive awareness of their work. Whereas there are a lot of people doing really amazing work out there that aren't seeking the attention because it's just who they are. Yeah. And those are the organizations that are most interesting to me. And these may be startups, but in many cases, they're 10, 20, 30, or 40 years old. So what do you, would you say, let's say we're in a the theater and we will do this conversation live and most of the theater is filled with this new wave of investors. So they're relatively new to the space. And they're super interested. They have seen the movies, read the books. And of course, we're not giving investment advice, but what would you tell them where to dig a bit deeper, where to engage a bit more, where to look for things that are maybe completely under that underrepresented, let's say, on the conferences and the media side at, at the moment? Where would you point them to? Like, okay, go and learn more there. Well, if we were sitting in a conference the tendency, you would probably be listening to a lot of the same companies that were at the conference that happened last week, the week before that, and before that. 
there are a lot of people doing really interesting work in regenerative food systems that have been focused on this for quite some time. And I would encourage those people to ask themselves, you know, a few questions and to look on it, look past the pitch deck and just ask themselves, are the operations of this company aligned with what these people say they're doing? Does the background of the entrepreneur or the investment align with what they say they're doing? And one of the things that I find so interesting in impact investing generally is that there are, I tend to work more with family offices, but there are a lot of family offices who are very interested in having impact with their capital and aligning their capital with their values. And sometimes they're so focused on the outcomes that are being presented to them, which they want to support, that they forego their basic due diligence criteria in making investment decisions. And so I often see capital getting invested in enterprises that were started by somebody who has literally no experience investing in or operating in either the asset class or the category. And it doesn't mean that they won't succeed, but this is a very nuanced industry. And like any industry, having expertise is beneficial in improving your chances of succeeding. And so I find it interesting when people invest in those scenarios and then are surprised when it doesn't work out. And so I would encourage them to stick to their normal due diligence criteria and evaluate whether or not the team they're betting on has the expertise and the experience rather than just the vision to execute on that, on achieving those outcomes. Because if the company doesn't succeed, the outcome doesn't get achieved. So make sure you, you wear your quote unquote traditional investor hat or glasses when looking at these things and not trust as always the pretty pitch deck that almost anybody can put together and can make look amazing. But yeah, it needs to make sense operationally and needs to be done, which there are very few people that are able to do in any sector, able to run successful companies, let alone in something as complex as regenerative agriculture and food. And a question I always like to ask, definitely stolen slash inspired by John Kempf, what do you believe to be true about regenerative agriculture and food that others don't? Like, where are you contrarian? We've heard a few things already, but what would be the main thing you would see? Like when you're at these conferences, et cetera, where would you see yourself like, wow, I'm really thinking differently here? Well, I don't know if I'm thinking so differently, but something that I didn't anticipate, but became very evident to me over the last couple of years was just this tendency to invest in small startups that we're inventing a solution where I believe that our most catalytic opportunity is to invest in scaled operations that have the values of regeneration. And I think of there being a spectrum from convention to aspiration, which I've observed over the last decade. And maybe this will provide some context for the comment. If you think about the conventional end of the spectrum, you have farmers and ranchers who are doing the best they can. They want their soil to be healthy their water to be clean and their operation to be sustainable into perpetuity. They may be undercapitalized, risk averse, and as a result of that are resisted to change. At the aspirational end of the spectrum, you may have people like us or academics or other families or whomever, entrepreneurs, who have a sense of what's possible and are interested in supporting you know, what's possible. And oftentimes I find the aspirational end of the spectrum telling the conventional and they're doing everything wrong and the conventional end telling the aspirational end of the spectrum that they don't get it and it's hard. And I think they're both right. But if you think about that continuum from convention to aspiration, there are dozens and dozens of attributes of, of factors that dictate any enterprise's ability to get from the conventional to the aspirational end of the spectrum, especially if they have any scale, whether it's the skills of the team on a given day, access to capital, weather, markets for that product, public policy, and so on. And so, so often I find that most enterprises that have been around for any period of time end up somewhere along that continuum. And at 30,000 feet, you have capital that wants to solve for a broken food system. 
And so often, very understandably, I find that that capital wants to invest in what's possible. They want to invest in the future. And so almost all of that capital flows into the far aspirational end of the spectrum, into startups, because they want to be able to tell a story that their capital is creating the solution. But in the same way that exercising, eating simple foods, drinking a lot of water, getting sleep and reducing stress is probably the best way to keep your body healthy. It's a lot sexier and easier to talk about taking a magic pill. And so we have a tendency as people to hammer our bodies and then take drugs or something to overcome the symptoms of those decisions. But I think there's a really neat opportunity to jump into the middle of that continuum where you have scaled operations that aren't as sexy and may not look as great to tell a story or a harder story to tell in a quarterly report, but where there is a much bigger opportunity to drive impact toward a more regenerative food system. And let's see if you can or want to answer this question. I usually ask a question around what of you be in charge of a large portfolio? In this case, I usually mention 1 billion, but you might be able to raise that not tomorrow, but relatively soon. So let's say 100 billion, let's say a, a crazy amount of money. What would you focus on first? Like which part is it the animal protein side of things? Is it the vegetable protein? Is it the vegetables? Like I'm imagining you're mostly focusing on the US, but what are the I wouldn't say the hot sectors because that sounds wrong in a permanent capital structure, but what are the most exciting parts of, let's say, the food system currently for you? If you had almost unlimited resources, where would you focus on to move that needle and to start building this portfolio? So we probably don't have enough time to get into where we would focus. But what I would suggest is that I would start with several investments in companies that are do represent really great brands in their platform. And with if I knew we had or anybody had access to that capital today, it provides a scale that also would enable us or others to launch other initiatives and programs that complement that. So as we think about regenerative food systems, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship of investing in a single food company. What we bring to these companies is some perspective from soil to the consumer, but also a network of resources that include industry and academics and other participants in the space who all, as you know, are very interested in collaborating with one another. And with that comes a more collaborative approach to capital, whether it is financially focused capital, philanthropic capital, or even public capital. And so that kind of scale provides resources to do things that you might not otherwise be able to do if you're capitalizing these projects on a slower basis. What I hear is that the brand side of things is very interesting. I mean, the processing facilities, of course, are fundamental, but you very specifically said, I would partner with existing brands that have that trust relationship with the consumer, of course, have their relationship with their suppliers, but there's a lot we can potentially improve there, or there's a continuum and transition we can do there. But it building that trust relationship with the end consumer with the consumer is something that is very it takes time it takes time a lot of effort is very easily lost with a few scandals here and there so that's something that seems to be i mean we've seen that now people choose specific brands and the story and what lies behind that so would you say that's where the i wouldn't say the value lies but that's an entry point for you into the food sector yes it's I believe it's very important to work with brands that have already established that trust and credibility with the consumer. And through that trust and the opportunity to grow their products, that there's an opportunity to exponentially grow their impact. In having impact all the way back to the soil, there's also an opportunity to build resilience and durability in their supply chain and in their products. And so each of these things is mutually beneficial. And when we think about the building the fabric of any system, it's multidimensional. And so if we only work out one muscle in our body, it doesn't necessarily build the health of our body. But if we're thinking about all of the muscles and all of our organs, we do build a healthy body. And I think it's the same way for these companies. And so what I enjoy doing is partnering with 
the leaders of these companies to think about all of those different parts of their business, some of them supply chain related, some of them product related, some of them consumer related. And then there's also an opportunity for these companies to be leaders and to be models for other people to emulate. And that's a whole nother conversation. Which I'm looking forward to get into at some point, but being conscious of your time to ask a final question. If you could change one thing overnight, you have a magic wand and you have the power to change anything in the food and agriculture space. So not necessarily on the, on the investing side or like anything could change overnight, but only one thing, what would that be? If I had a magic wand, I would collaborate with others to redesign the federal farm subsidy program to level the playing field without getting into details of farm subsidies. It provides an incentive to perpetuate the worst of our current agricultural system. I think it's an incredibly difficult thing to overcome. We're seeing some changes in recent farm bills that support more regenerative practices and level the playing field in incremental ways. But we have a really long way to go. And if somebody gave me a magic wand, I think that's where I'd start. Super. Thank you, Stephen, so much for your time. And I'm very much looking forward to check in. We're now at the end of 2021, let's say in a year or so, and, and see what has happened over the last 12 months at Grounded Capital Partners and see where the industry is at that point as well and check in with you and all the work you have been doing and have done. Well, thank you for having me. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you and if you have the means, please join my membership community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on gumroad.com slash investing region egg or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course investing in regenerative agriculture and food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale and the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations um, institutional capital banks insurance companies etc is this course free no this is pay what you think it's worth meaning i have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you and i'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast um, we have people with very different means so i'm inviting you if this course is creating value to you and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soil builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. 
So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.